In the name of the Father, and the Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, thank you so much for giving us the gift of life and the gift of faith. Help us to grow in our faith every day. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be with you today. We've got lots to learn. Let's jump into it. Uh, we're on lesson number 11. And after this lesson, those of you who are taking tests, you'll be ready for test number two. And uh, I have uh, sent uh, an email yesterday. I sent an email to your parents with the answer key for test number two. So they'll have the answers. If you can't figure something out, they'll have the answer key there. So you can, you can take it as an open book test and look up all the answers. Uh, or you can take it as a regular test and, and study uh, and see how well you can do without uh, the book. That would be fun to test yourself to see how well you can do. It's fun to know things. Number, uh, lesson 11, number one. Many precise definitions regarding the nature of God, particularly the nature of Christ, were adopted in response to incorrect understandings, which threatened the orthodox belief of the early church. Okay, a couple words in there. The orthodox belief. I don't know how much you kids know, but the word orthodox can be used in a couple different ways. Today, we're using it to mean correct. Orthodox means correct. There's another meaning of orthodox as in the Orthodox Catholic Church. A thousand years ago, there was a big split between the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox, or the Eastern Empire Catholic Church. The Roman Empire had two major portions. The Western Empire, headquartered in Rome, and the Eastern Roman Empire, which was headquartered in a city called Constantinople. And about a thousand years ago, there was a big argument and they split. The Catholic Church split into two parts. We are members of the Roman Catholic Church. And, but there are, the other part of the church is called the Orthodox Church. We're not using the word orthodox today to uh, designate that church. We're using the word orthodox to mean correct. If it's orthodox teaching, it's correct teaching. The opposite would be a heresy. A heresy is a false teaching. So if something is heretical, it would be incorrect. If something is orthodox, it would be correct. You, you get that, kids? I, I hope you understand that because you need to understand that so that you understand the conversation here. Sometimes it, people get things wrong. In fact, it happens all the time. Jesus came to the world and he spent three years teaching his 12 apostles. The 12 apostles then spent the next 20 to 30 years after Jesus ascended into heaven, passing on everything that Jesus taught them, the apostles passed on to us. And the Catholic Church has preserved that deposit of faith, the entire faith, we call it the deposit of faith, the Catholic Church has preserved that 
from being polluted or changed or destroyed or lost or compromised, the Catholic Church has kept the deposit of faith and handed it on for 2,000 years now. Thank goodness for the Catholic Church. Otherwise, we would have no idea. None. We would have no idea what to believe. And today's lesson will really show us that. In the first century, the second century, the third century, there were many people who did not understand the faith correctly. And they would tell people what they thought. And if their ideas were incorrect, those incorrect ideas would be spread about. And sometimes a lot of people started getting the wrong idea about who Jesus was and what Jesus was and what Jesus did. So it was really important that the leaders of the Catholic Church correct these wrong ideas. And that's what they did. The leaders of the Catholic Church are called bishops. And every bishop has a local area that he is the ruler of, that he's in charge of. And so local bishops would have to make sure that if somebody in their area was teaching incorrectly, the bishop would have to correct that person and say, oh, you, you got that wrong, and get them back on the right track. Is that easy to do? No. A lot of times people are stubborn and they think they're correct. And so they don't want to listen to the local bishop. And they would not obey him. And they would go on teaching something that was incorrect. Thankfully, the church has been able to preserve the true teachings of Jesus and the truth about Jesus down to our day. So let's give some examples. Uh, number two, many bishops and leaders in the early church fought tirelessly against false teachings about God. St. Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, that's a very important city in Egypt. St. Athanasius was one of the great defenders of the faith against the Arian heresy. Arius was a priest in Egypt. And in his own mind, he got to thinking thoughts and he started believing things that were not true. He thought they were true. He thought he had it correct. But it wasn't in agreement with what the 12 apostles had taught us about Jesus. Anything that the 12 apostles taught us about Jesus is the truth about Jesus. We cannot add to the deposit of faith. We cannot subtract from the deposit of faith. We cannot change it, people. This is extremely important. We cannot change the deposit of faith. The, uh, the apostles passed on to us everything we need to know to be saved. 
and we cannot change it ever. If the world lasts another 50,000 years before Jesus comes back, someday Jesus is coming back, that'll be the end of the world. But even if we last 50,000 more years, we can never change the Catholic faith. We can never change the sacred tradition that was handed on to us by the 12 apostles. There was this priest named Arius. And he got to thinking that Jesus was not God. And he thought Jesus was kind of like an exalted human being. That he was like a Superman of some sort. But he wasn't God. This is talked about on page 71 of your textbook. If you have the textbook, I don't know if you have your textbook with you. How many people actually have the textbook? I see Ian's got it. Put your hand up. How many have a textbook? Okay, good. Most of you do. That's good. If you have it, you could look at page 71. At the bottom of the page, it talks about Arianism. Arius lived from 250 AD to 336. Arius taught that Jesus Christ was neither God nor equal to the Father, but was instead an exceptional creature who was raised to the level of son of God because of his heroic fidelity to the Father's will and his sublime holiness. Arians could not conceive that anything emanating from the supreme being or one could ever be equal to the one. And so Arius thought that Jesus was a creature that God had created Jesus. God the Father had created Jesus. And Jesus was not the same substance as God. He was a creature. He, he lived a holy life and he became the son of God. It was just a title for him. He really wasn't God at all. And Arius was a very good speaker. And he was very persuasive. And he got lots of people to believe he was correct. In Egypt, there was a bishop named Athanasius. And Bishop Athanasius was preaching and teaching and telling people, no, Arius is wrong. That's not what the apostles told us about Jesus. The apostles told us that Jesus is God. The apostles told us that there are three persons, but only one God. The Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But Arius said, no, there's one God, but there's only one person. Jesus is not God, and the Holy Spirit is not God. So Arius was teaching heresy. We call it heresy, something that is uh, incorrect teaching. And Athanasius was defending the orthodox teaching, the correct teaching. Well, it got really bad. The Arian heresy spread all throughout the Middle East and lots of Catholics, lots of people who follow Jesus thought Arius was correct. In fact, some historians think that maybe 70 or 80 percent of all Catholics thought Arius was correct. So eight out of 10 Catholics 
had it wrong. Well, this is a very bad situation. If you don't have the truth about Jesus, well, then you're not going to have the truth about a lot of things. I mean, this is a very basic teaching. It's like the foundation of a house. If the foundation is not correct, the house is going to lean or it's not going to stand well. And we have to have a correct understanding of who Jesus is and of who God is. And if we get that wrong, our whole faith is going to go wrong. So it's very, very important that we have correct belief about God and who he is. Well, the Arian heresy was messing everything up. So, the Roman emperor of the time, he called a big meeting of all the bishops of the world. And that is called an ecumenical council. Okay? I know it's a big word for you, ecumenical. It's in your vocabulary, number one. Look at your vocabulary there, number one is ecumenical council, a meeting of all the bishops from the whole world. When all the bishops of the Catholic Church get together for a meeting, that is called an ecumenical council. I'll spell ecumenical. E-C-U-M-E-N-I-C-A-L. Ecumenical. It comes from the Greek language, meaning worldwide or all-inclusive or everybody. That's a word you need to know, guys. If you want to be an educated person, you need to know that word, ecumenical. And so they had the meeting where the emperor lived. Anybody know where the Roman emperor lived in 325 AD? <laughs> Ian, do you know? Rome. No, he didn't. The, the, the emperor Constantine, he was in Rome, but Rome was a city that was falling apart. The streets were, were in bad shape. The sewage system was in bad shape. Uh, the city had a lot of problems. And instead of fixing up the city of Rome, he decided to build a new city about a thousand miles east of where he was. And so he had his people build a new city. And he named it after himself. His name was Constantine. And so the city was called Constantinople. Today, it's called Istanbul. The name of that city today is Istanbul. And it is in a country today that is called Turkey. Wouldn't you love to live in a country named after food? <laughs> Turkey. I love Turkey. Um, so the emperor was living in Constantinople, and so they had the meeting of all the world's bishops there. They had it in a suburb, a little section of Constantinople called Nicaea. And that is why this council is called the Council of Nicaea. Because that was a small area, a neighborhood in the city of Constantinople. Well, the bishops all got together 
and they discussed everything and they had Arius there and Arius presented what he thought was the truth and basically the bishops corrected him and said no you're not you're not teaching things correctly this is not what the apostles have handed on and so they said to Arius that he was wrong and that he should stop teaching his her heretical teachings. He didn't obey them very well. And it took a very long time for the Arian heresy to uh, be killed, so to speak, to, to stop it. It took centuries for centuries. Was he excommunicated? Um, I would think so, but I do not know that. I don't know for sure. Yes, he was excommunicated. Okay. I would think so. But um, it took centuries because people took sides. And some took the Aryan side and some took the Catholic side. And it took a very long time to get the Arian heresy stopped. And in fact, there are still some people today who are somewhat Arian in their thinking. I'll mention a little bit about that later. Number three in your notes, the church called several ecumenical councils in order to clarify the true faith in contrast to heretical teachings. The first such council was the first council of Nicaea in 325 AD, which condemned the Arian heresy. There have been 21 ecumenical councils in the history of the church. In about 2000 years, we've had 21 ecumenical councils. And so that averages about one every hundred years. We don't have these councils very often, but whenever there's a really big problem and the church needs to talk it over and we need to explain the faith so that everybody understands it, the church will call an ecumenical council and what we got from the Council of Nicaea is called the Nicene Creed. The bishops of the council, they wrote down exactly what we believe about the Trinity. So that people who wanted to know would have it very clearly. This, this is what has happened for the last 2,000 years. Somebody starts teaching something incorrectly, and the response is that the Catholic Church makes it very explicit. We, we write it down. We say, no, this is exactly what we believe. And this is how the creeds come into existence. Let's take a look at the Nicene Creed which is on page 77. And I want to show you just a few things in the Nicene Creed and, what, and how they got there. On page 77, we have it. And you know this creed because we say it every Sunday at Mass. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. Almost every single word in there 
was put there because of what Arius said. Let's go back. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. Okay, there is only one God. Lord refers to God. There is only one God. The only begotten Son of God. Arius said that Jesus was created. So the bishops in Nicaea, they said, no, he was begotten. He was not created. He was begotten. The Son eternally is begotten by the Father. I talked about that last week. Begotten is the male part of reproduction. The woman gives, the mother gives birth, the father begets the child. Born of the father before all ages. So the council was saying that Jesus is eternal. He existed before all ages, before time existed. Jesus existed. Arius claimed that Jesus was created, that when Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, that was the beginning of his existence. That's what Arius said, because Arius said Jesus was not God. So Jesus had a beginning, according to Arius, but that is not the truth. Jesus is eternal. He existed as spirit without any beginning. God is eternal, no beginning and no end. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Arius, his, his biggest error was he denied that Jesus was God. And so the council made it very clear that Jesus is God from God. The Father is God, Jesus is God. Light from light, true God from true God. They just keep repeating it. Jesus really is God. The council emphasized it so much because Arius had convinced most people that Jesus was not God. Begotten, not made. Arius said that Jesus was made. Jesus was created by God. And the council said no. Consubstantial with the Father. We had that word last week. Consubstantial, meaning the same substance. The same matter, the same essence. The same nature. Whatever the Father is, that's what the Son is. Arius said that God the Father was one substance, but that Jesus was a different substance. And so the council made it very clear. You're wrong, Arius. Jesus is God, and he is the same substance, the same essence, the same nature, the same spirit as God the Father. So we use that word consubstantial with the Father. He is, he, whatever the Father is, that's what the Son is. Through him, all things were made. Him refers to Jesus. Through him, all things were made. The council is saying that Jesus is the creator of everything that exists the entire universe, all the angels, everything that exists, Jesus created it. But look, in the very first sentence of the creed, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things. They said the Father made all things, and now the council says the Son made all things. 
right? And later in the creed, it'll say that the Holy Spirit is the Lord, he's God, and the giver of life, that the Holy Spirit makes all things. That's because all three persons of the Trinity do everything together. Even though they are three distinct persons, they all act together in everything they do. We talked about that last week. I hope you remember. I, I know, kids, this is, this is not easy. This is not easy stuff. You really got to try to focus. Lillian and Matthew, focus. Quit screwing around. This is not easy stuff, and it's going to get harder in the next few minutes. The, the words get very big. So Arius said that God made all things, and Jesus was just a creature. The council said no. Jesus made all things in union with the Father and the Holy Spirit making all things. Then the creed says, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. The, the, the creed tells us that Jesus really is a human being. He has a real human nature. You cut him, he bleeds. He works, he gets tired. He has to sleep sometimes because he's so tired. He has to eat. He gets hungry. He has a real human nature. He's really human. There were lots of people who didn't think Jesus was human. We're going to get to that in a minute. Arius put Jesus somewhere between God and man, that Jesus was some sort of special category. He was higher than man, but he was lower than God. And so the council writes a creed and says, no, he's truly God, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, and he's really man. He's really a human being. He was born of the Virgin Mary, and he became man. He was God who took on a human nature. The creed tells us very clearly what we believe about Jesus and about who he is and what he is. Who is he? He's God. What is he? Excuse me. Who is he? He's the second person of the Trinity. He's Jesus. What is he? He has a human nature and he has a divine nature. He has, he's man and he's God. He's not half and half either, kids. He's not half God, half man. You've seen those, you've seen those uh, stupid creatures called centaurs. They're like half. They got like the, the 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 half a body of a man and half the body of a horse. You, these these mythical creatures, a centaur. That's not Jesus, people. He's not half God and half man. He's completely God, and he's completely man. Our minds cannot grasp that. He's total God and he's total man. He has a real divine nature and a real human nature. Okay. So, do you see the, the principle I'm trying to get at here? When somebody comes along and they do not teach the truth about Jesus or about God or about the faith, the bishops of the Catholic Church get together in an ecumenical council and they make it very clear and explicit 
what we believe. Now, nobody has to believe it. We all have a free will. And so if you say, well, I don't believe what the Catholic Church teaches, well, there are people like that, and they go off and they have their own religion, and they believe what they want to believe. But thanks be to God that we've had the Catholic Church for 1,900 years, and the Catholic Church has preserved the teaching of the 12 apostles so that we know what the 12 apostles taught about Jesus. And what they taught about Jesus is the truth. Jesus spent three years with them. Jesus gave them all of his teaching, and they passed it on, and it's been passed on down through the generations to us. And thanks be to God, we have the Catholic Church. There are so many heretics down through the 1900 years. So many people who, who get it wrong, and they want everybody to believe what they think is the truth. Let's go through a few of these heresies that occurred in the first 300 years, 400 years. Um, we'll do that as we go through the vocabulary. Let's fill in our vocabulary, and then we'll hit some of these heresies. Number one was ecumenical council. Number two, heresy, H-E-R-E-S-Y. H-E-R-E-S-Y, a false teaching. A false teaching is called a heresy. Number three, orthodox, O-R-T-H, O-D-O-X, orthodox. That is a correct teaching. If something is the correct teaching, we call it the orthodox teaching. Number four, okay, this is one of the early heresies, Gnosticism. That's how you say that word. The, the G is silent. Gnosticism. G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M. Salvation based on secret knowledge. Christ was not fully God or fully man. Gnosticism said a lot of things, and there were a lot of variations on it. But basically, the Gnostic, by the word gnosis in Greek, means knowledge. And that's where this heresy gets its name from. Gnosticism was a belief system that said you have to have certain knowledge in order to progress on to some sort of afterlife. And if you don't have that correct knowledge, you will um, you will not make it. And the Gnostics thought they had this secret knowledge and nobody else had it. Number five, Montanism. There was a guy named Montanus. And this heresy is named after him. They believed in direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit and rejected the authority of the church. God was one person who acted in three modes. The Montanists, the people who followed this guy named Montanus, they felt that they had the Holy Spirit and they felt that they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, we say that the apostles were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And their writings were inspired by the Holy Spirit. We call that the, the New Testament, the Scriptures. Well, these people, they thought they were inspired by the Holy Spirit too. And they thought that their teachings was just as correct as the teachings of the 12 apostles. 
And man, there are tons of people like that today. I met a lady just a few months ago, and she, she thinks totally that way. She doesn't believe at all in the Catholic Church. She says, I have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit guides me. And so what she believes, she says, that's the truth. If it's the opposite of what the Catholic Church believes, she said, well, the Catholic Church is wrong, and I'm right. Well, that's the way Montanus was. Montanus, he thought he was guided by the Holy Spirit. And for example, he said that God is only one person. And sometimes God acts like father. And sometimes he acts like the son. And sometimes he acts like a spirit. We had that last week, kids. And it, I would be shocked if anybody remembers What's that called? What heresy is that known as? Starts with an M. Modalism. You know what the word mode means? Modalism. I, I gave you an example. Like I could be a, a, a son to my father. I could be a husband to my wife. And I can be a father to my children. So sometimes I'm acting in the role as a husband. Sometimes I'm acting in the role as a dad. And sometimes I'm acting in the role as a teacher. Uh, and sometimes, so you have different roles or different modes. And that's what Montana said. There's only one person. There's not three persons. No, he got it wrong. But he did not accept the authority of the church. And he said, I am inspired by the Holy Spirit. How could the Holy Spirit teach against something the Holy Spirit has already taught? Yeah. Well, he thought, no. he, he thought the church had it wrong, and he had come up with the correct teaching. Like, remember, this is very early. You're in the first, second century. And and people are still figuring things out. And he just didn't have it correct, and he thought he had it right. And there are tons of people like that to this very day. And that's why, as a Catholic, I follow the teachings of the magisterium. I follow the teachings of the church because I believe Jesus guaranteed that the apostles would be guided by the Holy Spirit. He didn't guarantee that I would be guided by the Holy Spirit. He didn't guarantee that you would be guided by the Holy Spirit. He didn't guarantee that Montanus would be guided by the Holy Spirit. He spoke to the apostles. And he said to the apostles, I will send you the Holy Spirit, who will lead you into all the truth. Jesus said to Peter, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus gave this guarantee of correctness to Peter and the apostles. He did not give this to the crowd he didn't give it to all of us. He gave it to the leadership of the church. That's why as Catholics, we follow the leadership of the church. The apostles, before they died, they passed on their authority to other men whom we call bishops. And the apostles said that their authority to teach in the name of Jesus and to teach correctly without error, that was being passed on. That's why we follow the teachings of the Catholic Church. I mean, that's so critical. Once you get that, once you understand the authority system that Jesus set up, well, then you would say, well, I have to be a Catholic and I have to follow the teachings of the Catholic Church. 
because that's guaranteed to be correct. That's the system that Jesus put in place. But sadly, there's a lot of people who don't get that. They don't get that. They don't understand that system. I sure hope you kids will. I really hope you will understand that authority system that Jesus established. And I will teach it to you over and over throughout this course. I will remind you of this several more times. Once you understand this is how Jesus established the church and how he has set it up and how it has functioned for 1900 years, you will never quit the Catholic Church. You will never leave the Catholic Church. You will never uh, disagree with the teachings of the Catholic Church. I submit my mind and my will to the teaching authority of the Catholic Church, just as I submit my mind and my will to Jesus himself. If Jesus were walking on this earth and he came to my house and he said, Henry, this is what you need to think and this is what you need to do, I would think and do exactly what he says. And the way that Jesus communicates to the world today is through the Catholic Church. It's not that hard to understand. We got to get back to our her early heresies here. Number six, docetism or docetism. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that word. I've always said docetism. D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M. Jesus was not truly human and did not actually suffer. It only appeared that way. These people thought that Jesus was not a real human being, that he was like an apparition. Have you ever heard of an apparition? Kind of like a ghost appearing, or maybe Mary appears to Bernadette at Lourdes, or maybe Mary appears to the three children at Fatima. You've heard about those things, I hope. That's called an apparition. And an apparition can be uh, extremely real. The, 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 the visionaries, the, the children, the people who have these apparitions, they say that they can hear the apparition speak. They can see the apparition. They can touch the apparition. It looks and feels extremely real. The docetist, they said Jesus was just an apparition. His whole life was just a, a fake out. He wasn't real. He didn't really bleed. He just looked that way. He didn't really suffer on the cross. It just looked that way. He didn't really die. He didn't really resurrect from the dead. It was all just an apparition. It wasn't real. He wasn't a human being. They got it wrong. Seven, Arianism. Well, we talked a lot about that. It's spelled A-R-I-A-N-I-S-M, named after Arius. Jesus was not God, but an exceptional creature. Number eight, Nestorianism. Let me spell it, big word, N-E-S-T, like nest, N-E-S-T-O-R-I-A-N-I-S-M. There was a man named Nestorius, and he was the bishop of Constantinople. He was a very big-time church leader, but he got things wrong. He said Jesus was the union of two persons, one human and one divine. No, Jesus is one person. Remember last week we said person is who someone is? Jesus is only one person. There's not two Jesuses. But Nestorius thought there were. Nestorius thought there was a heavenly Jesus, and he thought there was an earthly Jesus. No, 
There's only one Jesus. He existed as spirit, and then he took on a human nature. It's like me. I'm one person. I'm Henry. But if I put on a coat, I'm Henry with a coat on. I'm not two Henrys, okay? Jesus existed as spirit, but he put on a human nature. And he came to the, he came to this world in a human nature. So he's really God and he's really man. See, Nestorius, he said that Mary should not be called the mother of God. Nestorius said, we should say Mary is the mother of Jesus. But don't call her the mother of God. He couldn't see how a creature, Mary, could give birth to God. He said that Mary gave birth to Jesus's humanity. Mary only gave birth to his body. She did not give birth to a divine person. Well, he had that wrong. And the church had the Council of Ephesus in the year 431. And the Council of Ephesus said, Nestorius, you're wrong. Mary gave birth to Jesus. And Jesus is God. So she gave birth to a divine person. Did Mary give birth to God the Father? No. Did Mary give birth to the Holy Spirit? No. Did Mary give birth to the Blessed Trinity? No. But she did give birth to Jesus. Is Jesus God? Yes. Jesus is God. And she gave birth to Jesus. So it is very accurate to say that Mary is the mother of God. Would it be accurate to say Mary's the mother of the Trinity? No. But she is the mother of God because she gave birth to a divine person. You can't, you can't split Jesus from his body. Just like me, I'm Henry. But I'm in a body for crying out loud. <laughs> if I don't have a body, I'm not Henry. I'm a nobody. <laughs> you get to have a nobody. If I don't have a body, I'm a nobody. Come on. That's pretty funny. Um, thank you. Somebody laughed. Um So that's Nestorianism. Number nine, Theotokos. Let me spell it. It's a Greek word. It means God bearer. T H E O T O K O S. Theotokos. Told you there's going to be a lot of big, tough words here. That's a Greek word meaning bearer of God. Who do you think the Theotokos is? Who is the bearer of God? Mary. Mary, you are correct. Mary is the Theotokos in Greek. That's a Greek word. They call her the Theotokos. She's the bearer of God. She had God in her womb and she gave birth to God. She is the mother of God. Number 10, monophysitism. Let me spell it. M-O-N-O-P-H-Y-S-I-T-I-S-M. That's a Greek word that means Christ had only one nature. One nature. Mono, you know mono. Mono means one, right? Monotheism, we had that word already, one God. Polytheism, many gods, right? Poly means many. 
Bi means two. Mono means one. You got that, right? You, you kids know that, I hope. And these people said Christ only had one nature. He was not God and man. He was only God. There were some people like Arius who said that Jesus was only human. There were other people who reacted and said, no, he's only God. He's not human. He's only God. See, people get from one extreme to the other. Some people thought Jesus was only God because of the amazing miracles he did. Other people said he was only a human because they couldn't believe that God would take on a human nature. And both sides had it wrong. As the creed tells us, he's God from God, light from light, true God. And then later the creed says he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. So he's God and man at the same time. 11, monothelitism. Let me spell it. M-O-N-O-T-H-E-L-I-T-I-S-M. Monothelitism. That means one will. There were people who thought Jesus only had one nature, so he only had one will. But as you know, we teach that Jesus had two natures. He's one person, Jesus, but he had two natures. He's truly God and he's truly man. So as God, he has a divine will. As man, he has a human will. How many natures do you have? One. How many wills do you have? One, do you have a human will or a divine will? Human. You have a human will because you are a human being. Jesus was God. He had a divine will. Jesus was a human. He had a human will. Now, Unlike you and me, his human will was always in perfect harmony with the divine will. Jesus never committed a sin. He always said yes. He always said yes to his heavenly father. Jesus said, I say only what I hear the father saying. On another occasion, he said, I do what I see the father doing. Jesus was in perfect union with his Father. It would be great if you and I were always in perfect union with God's will. In the garden, Jesus was facing his great suffering, and he said, Father, if there's any way possible, let this cup pass away from me, but not my will, but your will be done. He always submitted his will to the will of the Father. That's what you and I should do. We should always repeat that prayer with Jesus. Not my will, but your will be done. You want to please God. You want to do what God wants you to do. When you use your will to oppose God and say, oh, I know that you want me to tell the truth, but I want to tell a lie here because I want to get out of trouble. See, that's what sin is. You are choosing to oppose God's will. Let us always choose to do God's will in every situation. Um, in the name of the Father, and the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the gift of life and the gift of faith. We thank you that you took on a human nature and that you died for our sins so that we could have eternal life with you forever in heaven. Help us, Lord, to always submit our will to your will, 
and to live a life that is pleasing to you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, that's the end of Lesson 11. For those who are taking tests, you have got... Uh, it's, it's listed in the email. It's R-E-L for religion, 301, R-E-L 301, T for test number two. And you can study up for that. You can take it as you want. I, I really do urge you to do that. I urge you to read that textbook. There's, there's a lot of stuff in there that I don't get to talk about, but it's good stuff. And the whole idea here is that we learn our faith so that we don't become a heretic. <laughs> I don't want to see you kids grow up and become heretics and get it wrong and start teaching the wrong thing about Jesus and about the Blessed Trinity. And um, I don't want you to grow up and quit the faith and and start your own religion like some people do. Uh, okay, uh, so next week, uh, the next two lessons, lesson um, 12 and 13, and that's about 10 more pages. Let's see, we just finished lesson 11. And lesson 12, we go to God the Father. And so we'll be doing 12 and 13, and maybe even into 14. We'll see. Just read about 10 more pages of your textbook. And um, take your test, and we'll, uh, we'll see you next week. i got to stop my recording here. Any questions from anybody?